Hi, this is Dr. Bueller, and we're going to talk today about retroviruses, specifically HIV and the associated disease AIDS. We've got some terminology that I want you to take a look at before we get started. And one of the most important pieces of terminology here is that we'll be referring to RT a lot, and that stands for reverse transcriptase. And that's a very specific DNA polymerase that replicates RNA to DNA. And that's an HIV enzyme that's not found in human replication. So there are a lot of retroviruses out there. This is only showing a subset of them that are the lentiviruses that infect primates. Retroviruses are specifically defined as viruses that go from RNA to DNA, and they use a specific polymerase reverse transcriptase. It's important as we go through to remember that reverse transcriptase is in the family of DNA pulse. It's just one type. So there are a lot of retroviruses that can infect primates. The S here is for simian, and you have some in monkeys, you have some in gorillas, and you have some in humans. The major retrovirus that we're going to see in humans is going to be HIV, or human immunodeficiency virus. And there are actually two different forms of HIV. We have HIV-1, which is the most common form, and that's the form that's spread throughout the world because it's the most virulent. And then there's a separate HIV-2, which is not as virulent and therefore hasn't really spread out from the area in which it first jumped from other primates to humans. So when we're talking about HIV, we're going to be referring to HIV-1. I already told you twice that HIV is a retrovirus, but I'm going to mention it again because it's so important for the pharmacology. Retroviruses are going to require a couple of things to happen. They're going to need viral proteins, and they're going to need viral RNA for new viruses. So they've got to do these two different things. If they're going to make viral protein and they're coming with viral RNA, retroviruses are going to have to synthesize their RNA into DNA and then make mRNA from that. In order to do that, they're going to need this viral reverse transcriptase, and they're going to need a standard RNA pulp that they're going to use the human form. They're also going to then use human ribosomes in order to make the protein. In order to create viral RNA for new viruses, they're going to start with that viral RNA, they're going to use that reverse transcriptase to make viral DNA, and then they've got to turn that back into viral RNA for packaging in the new viruses, and they're going to use our human RNA pol for that. And the reverse transcriptase is going to be the only one of the pols that's coming from the virus. I've talked about latent viral infection before, but it's such an important part of HIV infection that we should definitely review it. When we get viral infection of a host cell, we usually think of it as replicating in the cell and then causing death of the host cell. We also had viruses that are going to replicate but very slowly and have a persistent infection that's going to last quite some time. However, retroviruses, once they've replicated their RNA into DNA, are going to insert that DNA into the genome of the host cell. So now that viral DNA is actually in your chromosomes, and it can sit in your chromosomes for a long period of time. It can be in there for years without expressing itself. And we're going to call that a latent infection, when you have cells that are infected, but they're not actually replicating virus. A lot of the antivirals we use are only targeting replication steps. So those drugs are only going to act on viruses that are actually being replicated. These drugs aren't going to be able to act at virus that is integrated in a latent infection. So with the HIV drugs that we have, we can kill that replicating virus so we can slow down the progression of the disease, but it's actually impossible to eradicate the virus from the body. And at any point when the immune system drops or the virus begins expressing itself again, you can have increased replication and disease onset. So we see that kind of resurgence of latent viruses in HIV, and we also see that in some DNA viruses like varicella zoster, which in its original form causes chicken pox, but then when latent infection starts to reoccur can cause symptoms such as shingles. So like basically all viruses, when you're infected with HIV, your body's going to respond with kind of a generic immune response. So fever, muscle pains, fatigue, and most people who have been infected with HIV can look back and identify that they did have some kind of acute viral infection symptoms. Like most viruses, there are specific cell targets, and HIV is going to specifically infect T cells that have a marker on them. So these are the only cells in the body that are expressing this CD4 marker. And if you remember, T cells are one of the immune cells in the body. So you can have this acute viral infection, 
But then, as I said, that viral DNA gets integrated into our own genomic DNA. And that occurs through an enzyme called viral integrase. So integrase as integrate, or to come together, is going to insert that viral DNA. During chronic infection, people generally don't have symptoms, so that's the asymptomatic period. There may be some of that slow active replication where there are cells that are replicating virus, but it's at a very slow rate, and the body's immune system is still strong enough to keep that replication down. However, some of those cells that are infected with HIV aren't actively replicating. They have that latent virus and can't be targeted by any of our existing agents. So there's that kind of fight between this slow active replication of HIV virus and the immune system. And for the most healthy people with good immune systems, we're able to fight that virus off well enough that we keep a nice balance such that the immune system doesn't suffer too much. However, over the years, you are getting some progressive loss of those T cells. And at a certain point, the viral replication goes up and the immune system ability to function goes down until you hit a point where the virus is stronger than the immune system. And at that point, you get kind of an exponential decrease in immune function with an exponential increase in viral replication. And so now you're in a symptomatic period where you're having immunodeficiency symptoms. And once that progresses to the point where there's opportunistic diseases and cancers, we call that acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. There's no vaccine available for the HIV, and transmission is through blood and it's through sexual contact specifically semen or vaginal fluids. As far as viruses go, it's not particularly infectious in that unlike influenza or COVID, you can't get it through respiratory droplets. Unlike human papillomavirus or warts, you can't get it through regular skin. And unlike measles, it doesn't last out in the environment very long. So you really have to be directly exposed to HIV to where it has access to your blood. So anything that gets direct access to your blood, like needle sticks, transplants, IV drug use, those are going to be very high risk for HIV transmission. In sexual contact, the risk of being infected with HIV is going to be most when there's some access to the bloodstream, such as if there's micro tears in the genital tissues, if there's sores because of other STDs. All of these are going to allow access for the HIV virus. It's also important to know that in any penetrative sex, the receptive partner is at a much higher risk than the penetrative partner. The receptive partner is going to have a higher exposure to a larger amount of virus. So this kind of gets at some of why I talked about the disease progression. This looks really busy, but I'm going to break it down for you. Here we have a time course, and we have weeks, years. We're not specific about the time course because it's different for everyone. And then on the y-axis, we're going to have levels of different factors. So the red here is the actual HIV virus. And at the time of exposure, of course, there's no virus. Right after that, there's that acute infection. Your body's never seen this virus before. Then some of the immune system comes in and starts to fight it off. And levels drop. And then the immune system and the virus have some amount of balance. The length of that time depends on how immunologically healthy that person is which can really vary based on nutrition, other disease exposures, chronic stress, any other thing that might affect the immune system. In some cases, that balance only lasts for a few months. In some cases, it can last for years. And so that asymptomatic period can really vary in time. At a certain point though, the virus starts to win and you get viral levels coming up again. In the blue, we have HIV antibodies, in HIV, we don't really see antibodies forming usually until between one and three months post-infection. When you first get antibody production, we call that seroconversion. And so sero for serum and conversion for change, you're seeing those first antibodies in your serum. Those antibodies are going to go up and they're going to help maintain that asymptomatic period. So we had that seroconversion here. We had the asymptomatic period here. And then the last period is going to be when we see here in green the CD4 T cell count, that the CD4 T cell count is doing all right during the asymptomatic period, but then at a certain point it really starts to drop, and it drops far enough that the immune system is weakened and you get the symptomatic period where someone is mildly immunosuppressed and more likely to get infectious diseases 
But then we reach the point of really severe immune dysfunction where we say the immune system really just crashes. And at that point, it can't do much at all. And we call that AIDS, Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. And at that point, you're going to see a lot of severe infections or opportunistic infections, bacterial and fungal. And you're going to see the growth of cancers that your immune system had previously been able to keep under control. I want you to be aware of the difference between HIV diagnostic tests and HIV severity tests. So diagnostic tests are going to tell you if you are infected with HIV, it's not going to indicate the severity of any symptoms. So we can look at whether you have an HIV infection by looking at whether you have antibodies or by doing a blood test to see if you have RNA or any of the HIV proteins present. And I want you to think about what might be important about the point of seroconversion when you're choosing a diagnostic test. The tests for illness severity aren't looking to tell you if you have an infection. They're looking to tell you the effect of that infection on your body. So we can do a viral load test, which really is an RNA test for the virus. But instead of just looking at whether you have RNA or not, it's looking for the level of infection. So it's looking at the number of viruses that you have in your system. The higher your viral load, the higher your level of infection and your possibility to infect someone else. The other test is CD4 T-cell counts, and that's really just counting the number of CD4 positive T-cells that you have, and that's going to let you know how much immune dysfunction you have at the current time. So the HIV viral structure, as a retrovirus, it has RNA, it has a capsid, and is enveloped, and has two exterior proteins, GP120, which is here in the pink, and GP41, which is the light blue. The interior components of the virus include the viral RNA and three pre-made enzymes, reverse transcriptase, integrase, and a protease. And the viral integrase is the enzyme that's going to clip and insert the HIV DNA into the human DNA strand. So as always, I'm going to give you a preview of that life cycle so that when you watch the next video, you'll have an idea of what you're looking for. The HIV virus, I said, had two major proteins on the outside. It had that GP120, and then it had GP41. HIV viruses are targeting cells with the CD4 component on their membranes, which also have chemokine receptors. So for the docking infusion stage, the viral GP120 is going to bind to the CD4 on the human cells. Then it's going to change the conformation, and it's going to bind to those host chemokine receptors. There's different chemokine receptors on human cells, and the CD4 positive cells have both of these. So the host cell has them both, but different strains of the HIV-1 virus are going to either use CCR5 or CXCR4. So if we call something an R5 virus, it means it has to bind to the chemokine receptor CCR5. And if we call it an R4 virus, it has to bind to a CXCR4 receptor. Once this has occurred, the viral GP41 is going to bind to the host cell membrane, and then the virus is going to be endocytosed. Once endocytosed, the virus is going to release those three enzymes, its own reverse transcriptase, its own integrase, and its own protease. The first thing that's going to happen is that viral reverse transcriptase is going to replicate the viral RNA into DNA, and then the viral integrase is going to insert that into the host's DNA. So at that point, the viral DNA is inside the human chromosomes, and the human transcription translation process is going to take over thinking that it is absolutely human DNA. So your host cells are going to go on and make the viral enzymes, the other viral proteins, and replicate the viral RNA all on their own. The only thing that we need from the HIV virus at this point is going to be the viral protease. When the host cells are going to replicate and create viral proteins, they're creating them in a long polypeptide chain, and viral proteases are going to be needed to clip that chain and release each section so that they can fold up into individual proteins. At that point, when all structural proteins and all enzymes have been produced, those components are assembled and packaged, and then new viruses can be budded off. So here's a great detailed HIV life cycle video, and I've included some diagrams so that you can draw along as you go through the video.
Having looked at the viral life cycle for HIV and at each step, we should begin to be able to identify where our drug targets are going to be. We could target the original receptor binding of GP120 to the CD4, and that's a great drug target, and currently we don't have drugs for that, but they're in investigation. We could target several of the steps in binding infusion, from binding to the chemokine receptors to the GP41-mediated endocytosis. And we have drugs for different aspects of those steps. I want you to know what targets we have drugs for, but right now you don't need to memorize the exact drug names. You should just be able to know that we do have drugs for them. So remember, once GP120 bound to CD4, that's supposed to move aside so that the GP41 can then bind to the chemokines. We have an anti-CD4 antibody that binds to CD4 after it's already bound to GP120 so that that can't move away and you can't get the next interaction with the chemokine receptor. So that's a post-attachment inhibitor, and it's called ibilizumab. We also have a drug that blocks the CCR5 chemokine receptor. And so for the strains of HIV that need to bind the CCR5 chemokine, that's going to keep them from being able to finish their docking, and therefore the virus isn't going to be able to enter the cell. So it's important to know that that's only going to work on viral strains that need to use the CCR5. It's not going to work on viral strains that can use the CXCR4 because with those, blocking the R5 isn't going to matter. We have Meroviroc, or cells entry, and I always remember what this drug is targeting because it's a cell entry inhibitor. We also have a drug that blocks fusion of the two membranes, and it does that by binding the GP41, keeping it from connecting with the membrane, and that's Enfuvertide or Fusion. And again, I remember the mechanism because of the name Fuse. The three main drug classes have a lot of drugs and are the most commonly used, so you're going to be responsible for the drugs within these. We've got reverse transcriptase inhibitors. We've got two types, nucleoside analog reverse transcriptase inhibitors and non-nucleoside analog reverse transcriptase inhibitors. We've got inhibitors of the viral integrase, and we've got inhibitors of the viral protease. We're also looking at drug targets in the assembly and budding steps and those are an investigation. So a very important drug class here are the nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, and so they're the nucleoside analogs, and we also call them nukes. These were the first anti-HIV drugs that were developed, and they're drugs that are analogs, so they're shaped like a nucleoside. They come in here, and they're inserted into the viral DNA as the viral DNA is being produced but they don't allow insertion of another nucleoside. So they're chain terminators that block the ability to continue the DNA synthesis. These are specific to the reverse transcriptase. They don't have a lot of activity on human cellular DNA polymerases. We have abacavir, lamivudine, tenofovir, tenofovir, alafenamide, and emtricitabine. You'll notice that for tenofovir, we have an example where it's actually a nucleotide, instead of a nucleoside. And then for tenofovir alafenamide, which we usually just call tenofovir aleph, this is a prodrug of tenofovir and it has less toxicity. So in the newer combination drugs that are coming out, you're probably going to see tenofovir aleph instead of plain tenofovir. Nukes do have some major adverse effects. They can cause mitochondrial toxicity, which can cause cell damage in muscle tissue and nerves. And it can also cause lactic acid buildup and hepatic steatosis, which is fatty liver. And we'll talk about this on the next slide of how we get that mitochondrial toxicity. We also have some toxicity in bone. This is actually fairly common. We have lack of blood supply to the bone, and that can cause osteonecrosis. And we can also see osteoporosis, which is weakening of the bone. As I said, that's actually fairly common. 29% of patients on nukes are going to have some amount of osteoporosis after five years of treatment. This, of course, is progressive, and as the years of treatment increase, a larger percent of patients are going to develop osteoporosis. We've got a black box warning for that lactic acidosis, and we've also got a black box warning for possible exacerbation of hepatitis B infection if these drugs are discontinued. So this issue is only if you also have Hep B along with HIV. These nukes actually have some antiviral activity against the Hep B virus as well. 
So if you have hep B plus HIV and you're taking a nuke, it's going to be keeping your hep B infection down as well. Now, if you end up going off of the nuke, changing to a different drug class for your HIV, there's no longer anything holding the hep B infection down, and it can then be exacerbated. So this is only going to be an issue with the nukes because other HIV drugs like the protease or integrase inhibitors aren't going to be interacting with the hep B infection. So the last black box warning that you want to know is only for abacavir, not for any of the other nukes. These are HLA-mediated, so involved in cell recognition, and though rare, it can cause a fatal hypersensitivity reaction that can cause multiple organ failure. So there's some testing that's going to need to be done before abacavir can be prescribed. So I promised I would tell you why nukes can produce mitochondrial toxicity. And the reason for this is that all DNA polymerases are eventually related. Bacteria have their own DNA polymerases, viruses have their own, humans have nuclear DNA polymerases, and our mitochondria actually have their own DNA polymerase. So while you're thinking about HIV reverse transcriptase as an RNA-dependent DNA pol, it is producing DNA. That hep B interaction was because the reverse transcriptase was also somewhat effective against the hep B DNA polymerase. So you had a little bit of cross action there. But while the difference between the human and the HIV polymerases is really large, so we don't have a lot of adverse effects from cross action there, the difference between the mitochondrial DNA pol and the HIV DNA pol is less. So these nuke HIV reverse transcriptase inhibitors actually have some action at inhibiting mitochondrial polymerases. So here you've got those nukes having some crossover toxicity to those mitochondrial DNA poles. If you don't have really high mitochondrial function necessary, then that toxicity isn't going to be a real issue. However, in those high energy tissues or tissues with high metabolism, you're going to need a higher mitochondrial activity and you're going to see those effects more. So the muscle is very high energy, neurons are very high energy, and so decrease in mitochondrial function can be toxic for those tissues. The third thing that we're seeing, that systemic lactic acidosis, is really a result of your body ending up using anaerobic metabolism because of that decrease in mitochondrial activity. And anaerobic metabolism produced lactic acid. The other drug class of reverse transcriptase inhibitors were those that are not nucleoside analogs. So we call those non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, NNRTIs, or non-nukes. And these are really just allosteric inhibitors of the enzyme. So while the nukes were nucleoside analogs, the non-nukes are just coming in and blocking the activity of reverse transcriptase at another site. We have efavirins and we have ropivirin. And generally, you can identify the non-nukes by either a virin or a virin in their names. These don't have as wide of a variety of adverse effects, but they do have really significant issues with neuropsychiatric effects. Things like mania, depression, psychosis, hallucinations, suicidal thoughts. These can be very severe issues, as you can imagine, and it's actually pretty common. Up to 50% of patients may exhibit some of these neuropsychiatric effects. So even though this doesn't have that long list of adverse effects that the nukes had, this is something that's really important. The integrase inhibitors are maybe the simplest ones. These are inhibiting that viral integrase enzyme, and you needed that viral integrase enzyme to clip off the ends of the viral DNA and to then insert it into the human genomic DNA. If it doesn't get inserted into our chromosome, then in the case of HIV, our body's mechanisms aren't going to go ahead and transcribe and translate it. So without incorporation into our cell genome, there's not going to be any replication of the viral RNA or DNA, and therefore no replication of the virus. We have dolutegravir, bictegravir, and elvitegravir, and these don't have really severe adverse effects. The naming tip that I have is gravir. I think of grace for integrase. The protease inhibitors are our last drug class for HIV, and they're a big drug class. They're used very commonly. These guys also have a very simple mechanism of action. They inhibit that viral protease that comes with HIV. And remember, our ribosomes are going to make that viral RNA into a strand of viral polypeptides, 
those viral polypeptides have to be cleaved by the viral protease in order to create functional viral proteins and other enzymes. So blocking the protease is going to block production of active HIV proteins, and you're not going to be able to get replication. We have adizanavir, or reataz, ritonavir, or norvir, and arunavir, or prazista. And these are generally navirs. You can see there's many of these, but I'm really just focusing on the most commonly used. Protease inhibitors, unfortunately, do have some pretty severe adverse effects. They've got pretty strong GI side effects. They also are very well known for metabolic syndrome. And metabolic syndrome includes things like hyperlipidemia or high triglycerides, glucose intolerance, and insulin resistance. Protease inhibitors also have an extremely interesting side effect in that there are changes in fat distribution, so where the fat is in the body. And we call that lipodystrophy. Typically, you can see a decrease in fat in the face, in the arms and legs, and in the buttocks. So a lot of times when people are on HIV treatment, they may get this kind of thing where their cheeks are kind of sunken. It can also cause an increase in fat in the breasts, in the gut, and in the back of the neck, where it's what's called a buffalo hump. So like the nukes, the protease inhibitors are really not nice drugs. And unfortunately, in the past decade or so, people are less concerned about contracting HIV because there's this perception that it's easily treatable and that long-term drug use isn't going to be really problematic. Due to the fact that we're actually treating the virus so much better, the HIV medications themselves have become a much bigger issue. The other issue with protease inhibitors is they're really big inhibitors of CYP3A4, and so they're going to have a lot of drug interactions. So I'm either going to give you a quick reminder or a quick preview about what we call boosters. We can also call those pharmacokinetic enhancers. They have a really simple function, and that's that they are CYP3A4 inhibitors, so they decrease the breakdown of other drugs. In this case, they're decreasing the breakdown of protease inhibitors or entry inhibitors. When you think about this conceptually, think about the fact that you may be taking a protease inhibitor drug that's broken down so quickly that it's not really clinically effective. So our first booster was ritonavir. That is still present in some combos like Coletra, but the newer combinations that are coming out are almost always using Cobicostat. So if you see Cobicostat in a combination drug, it's not an antiviral. All this Cobicostat is doing is acting as a booster or a pharmacokinetic enhancer so that the other drug stays active longer. So remember, not an antiviral. So you're basically never going to be seeing individual HIV drugs alone. And the main reason for that is going to be drug resistance. It's really easy for HIV to mutate and become resistant to one drug class. But if you use agents from multiple drug classes at the same time that have different targets, it's very unlikely that the virus is going to mutate all of those targets at once. So now what we call highly active antiretroviral treatment, or HART, is always using two or more agents simultaneously. And in general, we're usually looking at three or four agents. There are multiple different brands of combination drugs that you can see here. I'm only going to hold you responsible for these four, which are some of the most common, and that's Bictarvi, Strybild, Genvoya, and Triumic. You're not going to need to be able to tell me the constituents if I say it's Strybild. You're not going to have to memorize what's in Strybild, but you are going to need to be able to tell me that Strybild is a heart agent, that it's a combination of different drugs used as an antiviral for HIV, and then if I give you the drugs that are within it, you're going to be able to tell me what drug class each of them is and what the mechanism of action is. So in addition to heart, which is only given if someone has already been tested as HIV positive, we also have a drug regime that can be used for people who are not HIV positive. So this is in the case of someone who's HIV negative. It's called PrEP, and that's for pre-exposure, and prophylaxis is to keep something from happening. So this is a preventative treatment. PrEP is supposed to be taken on a daily basis, just like you'd take a birth control pill daily. The two that you want to know are Truvada and Discovi, and they're actually pretty much the same thing. They have two different forms of tenofovir, but they're both specifically used for PrEP. And people for whom PrEP is a really good idea are people who are at a really high risk of HIV. 
PrEP has actually been shown to be extremely effective at decreasing infection rates. More recently has come the idea of on-demand PrEP, which means instead of taking PrEP daily like you would a birth control pill, you're now only taking it for three days around an incident of exposure. The protocol for on-demand PrEP is that you take two pills the day before a sexual exposure and then one pill and then one pill afterward. The obvious issue with that is if people knew the day before that they were going to have a high-risk exposure, you would hope they would be able to take measures to avoid that. So while on-demand PrEP is really designed for having the first dose the day before exposure, in practice, sometimes the first dose is taken the day of or even the next day. Taken after an exposure is obviously much less effective, but the statistics show that it does reduce infection better than nothing. So I definitely want you to be able to tell me the difference between heart and PrEP and on-demand PrEP.